Good morning, everyone. We are happy to welcome you to SDG's 2023 Pulse Variety Seminar. My name is Lori Friesen, and I'm the Seed Program Manager for Saskatchewan Pulse Growers, and I'm going to be your host for today's session. For those in attendance today, if you provided either a CCA or CCSC number at the time of your registration, you will receive credits for today's session. After this event concludes, a recording will be available on our website, so be sure to watch for an email from SPG on how to access the recording. Now, at the end of the presentations, there will be a live question and answer discussion. So if you have questions, please type them in the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel so we can address them at that time. Just a little bit about SPG. Uh, we are guided by a grower elected board of directors but driven to create opportunities for profitable growth for Saskatchewan pulses. Two of SDG's five key result areas relate to research, development, and extension, with the purpose of creating or purpose of increasing yields of established pulse crop and promoting the adoption of new pulse crop options. Today's session focuses on a topic that supports these key result areas. So I'm going to be kicking off the presentations by providing an update on upcoming pulse varieties uh, and on low bicing, con bicing, phalloween. Let's get my presentation up. Okay, that should be good to go now, I think. Yeah, that looks great. Lauren. Perfect. So we're going to be talking about new and upcoming pulse varieties. And we're going to start with peas. Now, over 80% of yellow pea acres are planted to eight leading varieties. And this graph shows the percent of acres occupied by six of those yellow pea varieties uh, from 2016 up to 2022. CDC Meadow, which is the, the, the light blue line, remains a dominant variety despite, despite its lower yield potential. Now, some growers like the earliness and good seed integrity of this variety. However, however, newer varieties have more to offer. Acres of CDC Meadow are steadily decreasing, and uh, except for a little blip here in, in 2022. And varieties that are gaining acres include CDC Inca, which is the yellow line, and CDC Spectrum, the green line, um, and AAC Carver, the dark blue line. Uh, the newer variety, AAC Chrome, which is this orange line, is emerging and is rapidly gaining acres as seed becomes more available. So emerging and upcoming yellow pea varieties includes a fairly impressive lineup, as you can see. So we're just going to touch on each of these varieties. We did a statistical analysis of long-term regional variety trial data, and this revealed that the top ranking varieties included AC Chrome, CDC Collison, CDC Citron, and CDC Hickey, whereas the dominant variety, CDC Meadow, ranked near the bottom. And just to note that some of the new varieties, AC Beyond, AAC Aberdeen and AAC Julius are not included on this just because they had insufficient years of data to include. So hopefully the, you'll see those in, in the upcoming presentations. Now just some of the emerging yellow pea varieties for which certified seed is available. Uh, AAC Chrome was developed by Agriculture Canada and is marketed by FP Genetics. It was the top ranking variety in statistical analysis of yield, and that was over 49 site years of data. AC Chrome has consistent high performance over multiple sites and years, so it has good adaptation to diverse geographies and environments. And this is a good indicator of yield stability, which is an important trait to have. Uh, overall, it yields 106% in the south and 104% in the north. It has moderate protein and good seed characteristics. CDC Loachko was developed by CDC and released to select seed growers in 2018. 
it boasts the highest protein of the yellow peas at 0.9% higher than the Czech CDC Amarillo. And this should provide a marketing advantage uh, for pea processing plants that are seeking high protein peas for fractionation. A certified seed first became available in 2021, so it is new to commercial production. The yield is good at 103% in the south and 104% in the north versus the Czech Amarillo. And in uh, uh, the long term analysis of regional variety trial data, it ranked fifth overall, and that was out of 22 varieties. Um, and that was over seven years of regional variety trials. And that also represented 73 site years of data. It has excellent standability and is rated good for seed characteristics. And these include seed coat integrity, dimpling, and greenness. Uh, AAC Aberdeen was released in 2019. It was developed by Agriculture Canada and is marketed by Alliance Seed. It is particularly high yielding in the south, where it yielded 108% of the Czech. It has 1.1% lower protein compared to the Czech, so it might not be the variety that you want if you're targeting the, the uh, pea fractionation market. Um, however, it is a good yielding variety if that's not where you're targeting. Uh, it has uh, um, oh, seed coat breakage and dimpling, sorry, are rated fair. So that's one thing to, to watch out for. But it does have a larger seed size of 1,000 kernel weight of 250. Now, AAC Profit is another variety developed by Agriculture Canada. And thus, this one is marketed by FP Genetics. It yields particularly well in the north where it yields 109% versus the Czech. So that's a good one for the North. It also has high protein at 0.8% above the Czech. And the uh, seed coat breakage for this one is rated fair. And just a note, I was talking to some uh, pea fractionation people in Manitoba, and they are actively seeking production of both um, a CDC Luachko and AAC Profit because of their high protein. So now for some upcoming yellow pea varieties for which we expect certified seed in 2024 or 2025. Here are two Agriculture Canada varieties, uh, both which were registered in 2021. Both of them have high yield in both north and south geographies, which again uh, indicates good yield stability. Both have good protein and a smaller seed size. AAC Beyond yields 107% in the south and 108% in the north, and seed coat breakage and dimpling are rated fair. AAC Julius looks particularly promising, yielding 110% in the south and 108% in the north. It has good seed characteristics and is re rated moderately resistant to fusar and root rot, which is uh, an improvement um, over older varieties. Uh, AAC Beyond is marketed by Cantera Seeds, and AAC Julius is marketed by FP Genetics. And again, certified seed anticipated for 2024 or 25. So now for a couple of CDC varieties. Uh, CDC Hickey and CDC Tolleston were developed for CDC and released by SPG in 2021. Both of these varieties have high yield in both the north and south uh, areas of the province suggesting good yield stability um, over multiple environments. Both are rated moderately resistant to fusarium root rot, which is an improvement over most older varieties, which are rated intermediate uh, for, for this disease. Both are rated good for seed characteristics. CDC Hickey has good protein at plus 0.5% versus CDC Amarillo. And it also has good standability. And CDC Tolleston also has good protein at 0.3% versus the check. And again, certified seed should be available in a year or two. And for an upcoming yellow pea variety, which we anticipate certified seed in 2025 or 26, is CDC Citrine. This was developed at the CDC and released by SPG in 2022, so it's fairly new. 
It has a high yield of 109% of the check in both the north and the south. Again, showing good yield stability. It is rated moderately resistant to fusarium and root rot, which is great, and has improved resistance to microsporella blight. It has good standability and seed characteristics. Certified seed, again, is anticipated in a couple of years. So now for some trends in green pea acres. Six green pea varieties compete for 98% of Saskatchewan green pea acres uh, in 2022. CDC Forest continues to increase year over year and is the dominant uh, green pea variety. The old variety CDC Striker is dropping steadily and now occupies only 8% of green pea acres in Saskatchewan. Uh, to lesser extent, green, uh, green pea varieties CDC Razor, CDC Limerick, and CDC Greenwater are slowly decreasing in the last two or three years in favor of CDC Forest. And this shows again the trends of the green pea varieties and CDC Striker, which is the green line, um, released in 20, 2002, has steadily declined in favor of newer high yielding varieties. Uh, CDC Green Water, which is the orange line, CDC Razor, which is the yellow line, um, CDC Limerick, the gray line, and CDC Spruce, the light blue line, all had rapid uptake when they were released, but are decreasing now in favor of CDC Forest, which is the dark blue line. Uh, when we did a statistical analysis of long-term regional variety trial data, it revealed that the top yielding varieties included the brand new variety CDC Husky, which I'll be talking about uh, really quick here, and as well as CDC Forest, CDC Rider, and CDC Spruce. Uh, previously dominant varieties CDC Striker and CDC Razor are ranked near the bottom. Uh, just a little bit about CDC Forest. It was released by SPG to select seed growers in 2017 and began commercial production in 2020. Uh, in eight years of testing, the regional variety trials uh, represent 83 site years of data. CDC Forest ranked second overall, and it was first overall until we introduced uh, the new release for this year, um, and is the highest yielding green pea currently available to growers. So it has demonstrated consistent high yield over multiple sites and environmental conditions, showing very good yield stability. Uh, it yields 102% of the yellow pea check CDC Amarillo in both the north and south, and is rated good for seed coat breakage and dimpling, but only fair for bleaching. Uh, there's an upcoming variety, uh, CDC Rider. This was uh, released to select seed growers in 2022, so it's in early stages of seed multiplication. Uh, certified seed won't be available for a few years yet. But in four years of regional variety trial testing, CDC Rider ranked third overall, just behind CDC Forest, and it yields similar to CDC Forest in the south, where it yields 101% of the yellow pea check. It has excellent standability, uh, best for the green pea varieties, and has good seed characteristics. It has improved disease resistance versus CDC forest, as it is rated moderately resistant to fusarium root rot. So that's another advantage for this new variety. And now for the exciting new release that is available to select seed growers this spring, is the green pea CDC Husky. This is the highest yielding green pea, uh, yielding 109% in the south and 108% in the north versus the yellow pea check CDC Amarillo. And this represents a 6 to 7% yield increase versus CDC forest. So this will be an exciting variety. Uh, it has good standability, similar to CDC green water, but even better than CDC forest and has improved disease resistance, again, rated moderately resistant to fusarium root rot, which is an improvement for forest. Uh, it also has good seed characteristics. So there's only 96 bags of breeder seed available for select seed growers this spring. 
so demand will likely exceed seed supply. So please get your orders in before the February 10th uh, deadline because there probably won't be any available after the deadline. So moving on to lentils. So now again, talking about the trends, uh, in this case, small red lentils. So the graph shows the percent of acres occupied by four uh, leading small red lentil varieties uh, from 2016 to 2022. Nearly 80% of small red lentil acres were planted with three leading varieties, CDC Maxim, CDC Impulse, and CDC Proclaim. Uh, CDC Maxim remains the dominant variety, and that's the, the blue line here. Um, despite its lower yield potential, uh, however, acres are steadily decreasing, as you can see by the graph, in favor of newer varieties CDC Impulse and CDC Proclaim, both of which were released in 2014 and which represent a six to eight yield advantage or six to eight percent yield advantage versus CDC Maxim in the south and about 2% in the north. CDC Impulse is tied with the more recent variety CDC Nimble for the highest yielding clear field variety and CDC Impulse also has the largest seed and that's represented here on the orange line so you can see how acres are increasing and starting to overtake CDC Proclaim um, even though Proclaim is still a very uh, very good variety. Uh, conventional variety CDC Red Moon, which is the yellow line at the bottom of the graph, continues to be the highest yielding small red lentil and yields 114% of CDC maximum in the south and 106% in the north. This was released in 2015, but uptake has been slow because of its lack of uh, herbicide tolerance. But I think growers are, uh, you know, even with the slow increase, it's sort of showing that growers are starting to see that uh, the yield advantage of this variety offsets the lack of uh, gummy tolerance. Uh, this past summer, SPG conducted a strip trial variety showcase at the two seed farms and uh, harvested area was approximately three and a half acres. And over that size, the yield of CDC Redmond was 26 bushels per acre versus 22 for CDC Impulse, 18 for CDC Proclaim, and 10 bushels per acre for CDC Maxim. So it's interesting that the uptake of CDC Red Moon has been slow because by comparison of the non-ME large green lentil CDC Green Star is the leading variety in terms of acres for its, its market class. So kind of hoping to see a little bit more uptake of CDC Red Moon. Uh, again, the, showing the yield rank of long-term statistical analysis. It reveals that the top three varieties are all uh, conventional or non-herbicide tolerant uh, varieties with CDC Red Moon ranking right at the top. Um, and in fact, in very diverse locations, it ranked near the top from, ranging from Rawson to Swift Current. So just any type of environment it tended to be the number one leading variety. Uh, this was followed by three Clearfield varieties, CDC Impulse, CDC Nimble, and CDC Proclaim. And the dominant variety, CDC Maxim, here ranked third from the bottom. So now I'll talk about a couple of emerging small red lentil varieties for which certified seed is available. Um, both were released by uh, SPG in 2019, so CDC Nimble and CDC Simi. Uh, CDC Nimble yields 108% of CDC Maxim in the south and 107% in the north. So this makes it the highest yielding small red lentil variety in the north and ties it with CDC Impulse as the highest yielding clear filled variety in the south. So it's a strong variety. Uh, slightly taller than CDC Maxim with a slight slightly smaller seed size uh, with a thousand kernel weight of 38 versus 40 for CDC Maxim. CDC Simi performs particularly well in the south where it yields 107% of CDC Maxim. And most other traits are similar to CDC Maxim, although seed size and thickness are slightly less. And now for a new release for 2023. 
uh, we have a new large red lentil, CDC IBC 1306, and there will be a registered name coming soon, hopefully. And this will be released to select seed growers uh, this spring. Now, this variety has very high yield. It yield, yielded 115% of CDC maximum in co-op testing. And um, it yielded 124% of CDC maximum in the south and 119% in the north in uh, regional variety trial testing. So this is a 11 to 18% higher yield than um, the King Red 2, KR-2, which was the large red, red lentil uh, that was released prior to this one. It has a seed size of 53,000 uh, kernel weight. So that's versus 41 for maximum. So that you know, classifies it as a large red lentil. It has a thicker seed than King Red 2 and is taller than CDC maximum. Now, SBD did release a large red lentil CDC Sublime in 2020. That one was released to closed loop non-exclusive sublicense. The reason for this is that CDC Sublime was unique in that it had a green seed coat. Therefore, closed loop production was chosen to ensure that there was no admixture of this type with large green lentils. Uh, 1306 has the correct seed coat color for a red lentil. Therefore, a decision was made for broad release to select seed growers. So this could re represent a good opportunity for seed growers and eventually for, for growers as well. And this just shows the three years of head-to-head -head testing results in regional variety trials. It's nice to be able to show head-to-head uh, -head results. Um, so they've all were you know, tested in the same trials. Then here you can see that uh, IBC 1306 the yield in the, the south and the north. Uh, CDC Sublime, uh, you know, yields a teeny bit higher, and it's the one that's uh, in closed loop production. And in comparison to King Red 2, which was the previous large red lentil, so it shows quite a bit of a yield advantage. And then you can just see in comparison to small red lentils, you see the, the yield advantage there. So there's only 71 bags of breeder seed available to select seed growers this spring. It's uncertain if this will meet uh, demand as this is a new market class for most growers. However, the improved performance may drive demand to exceed supply. So again, get your orders in before the deadline. Now talk a little bit about large green lentils. Uh, there are four varieties that uh, compete for about 85% of Saskatchewan acres. CDC Green Star, which is this uh, light blue line, is still the dominant variety despite not having herbicide tolerance. It is only recently decreasing in favor of a uh, newer variety, CDC Lima, which is this dark green line at the bottom. Acres of CDC Greenland and CDC Empower are also decreasing. In terms of yield ranking of long-term data, uh, you can see that the, the non-clear field line CDC Green Star is still ranks number one for yield, whereas the clear field variety CDC Lima and CDC Grim, which is an emerging variety, ranked uh, second and third, uh, very closely together, those two. Uh, now, just a little bit more about CDC Lima, which is a new variety of which certified seed is available. It was released by SPG in 2018. So it yields 93% in the south and 90% in the north versus the Czech CDC Maxim, um, small red Czech. And this makes it the highest yield, yielding large green lentil for the north. Uh, this makes, oh yeah, sorry, it is shorter than other large greens and has a large seed size of 1,000 kernel weight of 74. Now for an upcoming large green lentil, this is CDC Grim. Uh, this is a good yielding variety, uh, has improved disease resistance, so improved resistance to anthracnose, as it's the only large green rated moderately resistant. Uh, most large greens are rated S for susceptible, except for CDC Green Star, 
which is rated intermediate. So this one is uh, better than than the rest. It does have the largest seed in this market class, a thousand kernel weight of 75. It yields 94% in the south versus uh, the small red check and 84% in the north, making it the highest yielding clear field, large green lentil in the south. So it's a good one for that area. And certified seed is anticipated uh, for 2024. And just now for a small green lentil, I had to mention CDC Germany. Uh, this is an Emmy tolerant variety with excellent yield. It's well adapted to the brown and dark brown soil zones where it yielded, uh, or particularly in the uh, brown soil zone where it yielded 108% of CDC maximum. Uh, this represents a 2% yield increase over its counterpart CDC Kermit. And CDC Kermit is the non clear field variety. So this is an exceptionally yielding clear field variety um, to replace that variety. And this also represents a 14 to 18% yield increase over CDC Invincible, which is a dominant variety in terms of acres for this market class. It's slightly taller than CDC Invincible and similar to CDC Kermit. And it has the largest seed for this market class with a thousand kernel weight of 38 uh, versus 34 for either Kermit or Invincible. And certified seed is anticipated for 2024 or 25. Okay, now we'll touch on chickpeas. So there are several new uh, high yielding Kabuli chickpea varieties, either available or in seed multiplication. Um, all of these are tolerant to solo imazomox herbicide. And these include CDC Lancer, uh, CDC Orkney, and CDC Pearl. So a little bit about CDC Lancer. This was released by SPB in 2019. It yields 112% of the Czech Amet in the uh, brown soil zone and 105% in the dark brown soil zone. Uh, this makes it the highest yielding chickpea in the brown soil zone. And it has a seed size of 350,000 kernel weight and certified seed is available of this variety. An upcoming Kabuli chickpea is CDC Orkney. Now this was released by FPG in 2020. Again, it's tolerant to imazomox herbicide. It yields similar to uh, um, CDC Lancer and that is 111% of the check in the brown soil zone and 109% in the dark brown soil zone versus the Czech Amet. In eight years, eight years of regional variety trial data, statistical analysis ranked it first for yield overall, overall uh, geographies. It has a seed size of 355,000 kernel weight and uh, certified seed is anticipated for 2024. Another upcoming Kabuli chickpea is CDC Pearl. This was released to select seed growers in 2021. Uh, yields again similar to CDC Orkney at 111% of the check uh, in the brown soil zone and 108% in the dark brown soil zone. This variety has improved resistance to Ascochyta and showed less yield drop in trials where no fungicide was applied. Uh, it does have a smaller seed size with a thousand kernel weight of 327. And certified seed is anticipated for 2020. Another upcoming Kabuli chickpea was CDC Pasqua, again released in 2021. And although this one is lower yielding, as you can see here, uh, it boasts a larger seed size uh, with a thousand kernel weight of 476. Seed size may reach that uh, 10 millimeter size under good conditions. And again, certified seed is anticipated for 2024. Uh, there were a couple of Desi chickpeas that were also released in 2021. Um, CDC Sunset is the earliest maturing uh, Desi chickpea, maturing earlier, two days earlier than CDC Console. Uh, yield is good. In five years of regional variety trial testing, it yielded. 
102% of AMIC in the brown soil zone and 100% in the dark brown soil zone. And uh, a black desi chickpea was also released in 2021. Um, again, has improved resistance to Ascochyta versus Kabuli varieties. It is also early maturing. And uh, in four years of regional variety trial data, it yielded 100% in the brown soil zone and 92% in the dark brown soil zone. Okay, now I'm gonna switch over to fava bean and here I'll talk about new varieties as well as uh, talk about the low visine, fawn visine trait. So one of the limitations for fava bean is the presence of the anti-nutritional factors, visine and con visine. So these compounds can cause a rapid onset anemia in a small percentage of the human population that carry a genetic defect. Uh, and this can be quite serious. The condition is called favism, and it can be deadly. This has made food manufacturers leery to include fava bean as an ingredient in food products. And it can also be a concern for animal and poultry feed. So a solution to this situation is the introduction of low visine, con visine, fava bean varieties. Uh, the entire industry is switching to low visine, con visine, and all new varieties will carry this trait. And in fact, right now you can't enter a variety into either co-op testing or regional variety trials that isn't low visine, con visine. So to develop these varieties, a uh, gene responsible for the low visine, con visine trait was identified. Uh, and this reduces the levels of these anti-nutritional compounds by 99%. Uh, European lines that carry this trait, uh, such as AO1155 developed uh, in Inera, France, was uh, used to incorporate the trait into fava bean varieties uh, adapted to Saskatchewan production. Uh, just note that the A011 or AO1155 uh, was later registered in Canada as NAVI, variety NAVI. Breeding goals include yield potential, small seed size, food quality, and agronomic performance, including earlier maturity. Uh, a molecular marker for this trait was also developed, and this is an important tool for um, rapidly identifying breeding lines which carry this trait, and also for testing seed and production lots for purity for the low visine, con visine trait. So this has uh, represents a great opportunity. Fava bean has the potential to, or this has the potential to expand domestic fava bean markets. Fava bean has good potential for protein extraction for food ingredients, and processes are beginning to use fava bean for fractionation. Low visine, uh, con visine fava bean means that fava protein and fava bean flowers can be incorporated safely into food products. Fava bean has several advantages. It has a high protein, uh, 24 to 35%, which is higher than peas. And it doesn't have flavor issues associated with other pulp proteins. It also has a healthy amino acid profile. Some other advantages of fava bean, of course, include that it has the highest level of nitrogen fixation, or it acquires 88% of the nitrogen from the atmosphere, which reduces fertilizer use and uh, is good for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It is also resistant to aphanomyces, which can extend crop rotation. So, you know, this is a great opportunity. However, there are challenges, as there are with every uh, good story. Fava bean is partly outcrossing uh, through pollination by bees. Therefore, distances up to five kilometers are recommended to avoid contamination with high visine, con visine type. And this is really critical. Uh, for this reason, all the low visine, con visine varieties are released through closed loop system for to ensure good trait stewardship. Production fields must have large isolation distances of a minimum of two kilometers, uh, five is recommended, from non-low visine, con visine types. 
Uh, in addition, molecular and quality testing are needed for each seed lot uh, to ensure that the low visine con visine status is maintained. There are currently four white flower, zero can, and low visine con visine faba bean varieties. Um, all of these are in seed multiplication and are sub licensed for closed loop production. Uh, the first one there, Navi, is licensed at KGV Meyer Farms and has been assigned as the new Czech variety in trials, uh, replacing Snowbird. DL Nevado is licensed to Stamp Seeds. Uh, CDC 1142 uh, was released by SPG via non exclusive royalty free closed loop production sub license in Saskatchewan and soon to be sub licensed on a royalty basis outside of Saskatchewan. And CDC 1089 is a new and exciting release for 2023. So, talk about the new release CDC 1089. Uh, again, it's a zero tannin white flowered faba bean uh, to be released in 2023 through a closed loop seed and production agreement. Uh, now, this is the highest yielding variety of this type. And in uh, three years of regional variety trial testing, it yielded 111% of Snowbird and 105% of Navi, the new check. Uh, it has a smaller seed size compared to Snowbird with a thousand kernel weight of 386, where Snowbird is 480. And this makes uh, seeding easier and more economical without compromising yield. Uh, protein is slightly higher than Snowbird, and although it matures two days later than Snowbird, it does mature uh, several days earlier than Navi or DL Nevada. And again, this just shows the three years of uh, testing in regional variety trials and how the varieties compare. Uh, again, this will be uh, released through a non-exclusive royalty-free closed loop within Saskatchewan and a royalty-bearing sub-license outside of Saskatchewan. There are 43 bags of breeder seed and an RFP or request for proposals will be launched this month. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to my presentation. If you have questions for me, please type them into the question box and we'll address them in the Q&A uh, discussion at the end of the session. So uh, to move on now to our next speaker, I am very pleased to be joined by Dr. Sabine Benitsa. She is Professor of Plant Pathology and a Strategic Research Chair for Pulse Crop Pathology at the Crop Development Centre at the University of Saskatchewan, where she's been working on diseases of pea, lentil, chickpea, uh, bean, and fava bean for more than 20 years. With the emergence of root rot, her group has focused on emerging uh, root rot pathogens, particularly Aphanomyces and Fusarian, with the objective to identify durable resistance in pea, lentil, and chickpea. So welcome to you, Dr. Benita. Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you can see my screen now. Um, so I'm talking about root rot diseases today and in terms of variety development. I first would like to acknowledge um, our funding bodies, um, particularly the Government of Saskatchewan and also Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Western Grains and Saskatchewan Pulse Growers, but I also would like to um, acknowledge the Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities and the Saskatchewan Crop Insurance Corporations because they have been vital in helping us, assisting us um, and the Ministry with conducting service. I also would like to acknowledge that we are on territory Treaty Territory 6 and the homeland of the Métis and that we pay respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Very quickly, um, you're all aware that root rots are very widespread, not just in Saskatchewan, but right across the prairies. So here are two maps on the left hand, generally root rots in peas, on the right hand specifically Aphanomyces, 
in P, which are marked with the red uh, indicators, and in lentil with the yellow indicators. So the root rots have really become uh, a serious issue um, that needs to be addressed. Now, um, I've talked a lot about the Apanomyces in the past, um, but we now also have a fairly good idea about the Fusarium species that are in, on our pea, lentil, and chickpea roots. Um, so I have here three pie charts, for one for pea, lentil, and chickpea, with the different Fusarium species that have been isolated from the roots of these crops in commercial fields. Um, I've tried to color code them in a similar way, at least the, the most prevalent species, and you can see that Fusarium avenaceum, Fusarium solani, Fusarium redolens, and Fusarium oxysporum are the most common pathogens that we isolate from these roots of all three species. And based on pathogenicity testing, we know that Fusarium avenaceum um, appears to be the most virulent one, and so the breeding efforts right now are focused on Fusarium avenation. So looking at symptoms caused by Aphanomyces uticus, um, you're probably familiar with those most commonly. Um, they reduce, the serious infection reduces biomass of the root and the shoot, which you can see here quite clearly on the P at the top. And then you also typically see, if you have a pure infection of Aphanomyces uticus, you see sort of this discoloration of the root system, and it, it's probably most um, clear in the bottom with the lentil, you can see this discoloration to this caramel brown. With Fusarium avenaceum, you also have a reduction of the shoot biomass and the root biomass, but you can also see here very, very clearly this discoloration of the hypocotyl, so sort of the the stem based just at the soil level, and that's very characteristic for Fusarium avenaceum. Now, when you dig up uh, plants in the field, um, you often, or in, in many, many cases, have a mixed infection, and then um, sort of identifying what is there based on symptoms becomes a little bit more complicated. So I want to talk a little bit about resistance to root rots in pea first. Um, and what we have done here is um, introgressed or moved partial re resistance to Aphanomyces root rot in pea, focusing on major QTLs. QTL stands for quantitative trait locus, so that basically represents an area on a chromosome that is associated with a trait, and usually with complex traits like Aphanomyces root rods, you have many QTLs in the genome of, of a P that, that are associated um, with resistance. So that makes breeding quite a bit more complex compared to when you only have to transfer one gene, for example. We were very lucky in that our French colleagues had worked on um, this disease for decades before it hit us. And so they had already studied um, in quite a bit of detail the genetics um, of, of this um, resistance and identified many of these QTLs. And I'm showing seven of those here. So you have the names of the QTLs. And you have this column with the um, column heading LG, which stands for linkage group, which represents the chromosomes. And then you, at the very right hand, you have the R square value, which gives you an indication of the power of these Q2Ls. So the higher the number there, the, um, the bigger the power of this QTL for conferring resistance. So we focused on two with the highest um, percentage value there, APS 4.5 and 7.6A. Just for those who are really keen, um, I'm showing those um, two QTLs here encircled in green along the chromosomes. So these are the popsicle sticks here, um, the two chromosomes on which we have these QTLs. So on the left-hand side, you see regions that are associated with aphanomyces on the right-hand side of the popsicles, you see these funny numbers, and these are actually the molecular markers. So um, what Tom um, 
basically did together with my group is um, initiate an intensive back crossing breeding program for improving aponomyces resistance. So Tom selected multiple um, CDCP varieties that he wanted to use to transfer the resistance of the sources of resistance um, so that we ended up with germplasm that could be grown here commercially. So um, we selected two sources of resistance. Um, one was uh, resistor lines, which we refer to as PI lines, and the other source was 90-2079. Um, they have either the major QTL for 4.5 or 7.6, and they also had minor QTLs. So basically, um, that was done through, th through two streams. So I sort of colored coded them here, the green stream for QTL 7.6 and the blue stream for 4.5. And then um, we went through the generations and you can see that they were crossed three times with the CDC parents to make sure that um, sort of the, what the end product is has many of the um, good features of the CDC parent. And you also notice these gray bubbles um, with the letters MAS, that stands for Marker Assisted Selection. So that's where we used the information our French colleagues had generated um, and screened for molecular markers that indicated whether the QTLs were still present in the offspring. And we always selected the offspring that, that had all the molecular markers. And um, that proved to be a really useful tool because we only needed to phenotype at the end of the green and blue stream. So that's when we basically do conventional pathogenicity testing. We selected the, the best in the green stream and the blue screen stream and then combined them, crossed those, um, solved them a few times, tested them again with molecular markers and through conventional um, pathogenicity testing and then sort of looked at the results and it seemed we did something right um, because uh, the, the lines that came out clearly had better resistance. So this is shown here in this graph. Um, on the vertical you have root discoloration, so the higher the bar the more severe the root rot. Um, on the very right in black you see CDC meadow which we have in all of our tests um, as a control. Then you see five red lines. These are the CDC lines that Tom had selected for the back crossing. There is one green CDC forest and the other four are yellow peas. The blue columns are the sources of resistance and you can see that they have quite a bit um, less disease severity compared to the, CDC, the red lines and the black CDC meadow. And then the green lines are the end product of combining um, the two QTLs here. And um, if you look at those, you see that you have only between 20 to 43% disease compared to anywhere around 70% in the original parents. So what Tom um, has done now, he has selected the most promising line and they um, went into yield trials in 2021 and in a field disease nursery and I will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, in last year he started to produce um, breeder seed for those and then um, we are intending to enter them into co-op trials this year so they will have to be tested for two years and then hopefully by 2025 um, we can register these lines as varieties. Um, I want to emphasize that the disease ratings you see here is under controlled conditions. So we haven't done um, field assessments and I will talk about that, um, the reasons why we haven't done that in, in a short while. So you, you may say, oh, well, every year she's talking about why well, we are developing these varieties and why does it take so bloody long to develop a P variety with partial resistance to aphanomyces? Um, it's just a long process and really we benefited greatly um, from the research that our French colleagues did. And just to emphasize this, I sort of dug back into the literature. So in France, they started uh, work to study the genetics of aphanomyces root rot resistance in 1996. In 2020, they released the first French pea variety with partial resistance to aphanomyces root rot. 
So it took them 24 years to get from identifying resistance and starting to um, study the genetics to developing a variety. We started our backcrossing program in 2015, and with some luck, we can register our first variety in 2025. Um, that is 10 years. So yes, it takes a long time, but if we had had to do all the research that the French did, it would have taken much, much longer. So I emphasize that all the testing so far has been under controlled conditions. Now, um, we have been developing a root rot nursery. Probably some of you will roll your eyes and say, well, you have to develop a root rot nursery. Why don't you just pick a commercial field? Obviously, we want to have it close by and a very controlled conditions. Um, and so we picked a, a field close to the university, um, basically inoculated it with Apalomyces. And in this graph here, you can see that within um, five years, we've sort of really increased the pathogen in the disease nursery. And on the right hand, you can see some pictures that are probably very reminiscent of what you see in infested fields. So it is working, but, and this is a big but, um, although we were hoping we would have a pure Aphanomyces root rot resistance nursery, um, of course, we also identified Fusarium. And again, that is very similar to what most growers experience in their fields. Um, and so that limits sort of what data we can get out of this nursery. So if we planted our partially resistant, um, Aphanomyces resistant accessions into these fields, obviously, well, maybe they show some resistance, but the resistance to Aphanomyces may be masked by the susceptibility to Fusarium. So that means sort of we, we will continue to be dependent on indoor testing, but once we have combined Fusarium and Aphanomyces resistance, then this nursery will be very, very effective and I guess also very beneficial to growers because, well, the situation is similar in commercial fields. Talking of Fusarium abinaceum in particular, um, I pointed out this is um, the most virulent species, it appears to be the most virulent species in pea, lentil, and also in chickpea, in fact. And so um, Tom has, of course, started working on Fusarium together with our group and um, started screening a very large diversity panel. So these are over well over 200 lines here that he tested to see whether any of these um, have resistance to Fusarium. So again, on the vertical, you have root rot, uh, Fusarium, abinaceum resistance, and then the bars represent different lines. So you see a, a wide range here, and um, you will maybe jubilate and say, well, wow, there are some lines that have very, very little disease. Yes, there are, but there, this resistance is very strongly associated with seed coat pigmentations. So the peas that tend to have very high Fusarium abination resistance are also the ones that have a seed coat we do not want because you want yellow and green peas and they have basically a translucent seed coat um, and you don't want a brown seed coat. So there are some um, lines that did better, um, of the, the non-pigmented -pigment, um, lines that did better in terms of resistance. So uh, examples here are Cameo and AAC Profit. And I have um, sort of color coded Cameo here in green. So you can already see that because um, what Tom has done now, he has crossed Cameo with um, CDC Livochko, which I highlighted in red here, to develop a mapping population, um, sort of to go through the process of studying the genetics and more specifically identify molecular markers. Because as I have shown with the Aphanomyces example, these molecular markers are really, really helpful um, for selection of lines and can um, really speed up the breeding process or the selection process. Moving on to root rot in lentil. So in root rot um, in lentil, we obviously also have Aphanomyces uticus and then um, a very similar spectrum of Fusarium species. And again, Fusarium avenaceum appears to be the more virulent one. 
So um, what we had done previously, we, um, we had screened, of course, all our varieties for Apanomyces root rot resistance, and they were all susceptible. We screen different lines, diverse lines of the cultivated species. They were all susceptible. And then because we have a large collection of wild lentil species, we screened uh, many of the wild species. And um, just to show you here, this is Lens culinaris here. Lens avoid is sort of maybe a little bit better than Lens culinaris, um, but very difficult to work with because it's a distant relative of the cultivated species. Lamotti eye, more interesting. You see that the, the rating here shifts more towards a two, which you can see on the horizontal axis. Nigricans, Nigri not so interesting. Odomensis seems to be very susceptible, more shifting to ratings of three and four. And Orientalis, um, sort of in the middle, but with a lot of accessions that had a rating of one. And Tomentosis, again, um, more on the susceptible side. So um, we were very pleased with these results because we found a high, a high number of um, partially resistance in lens orientalis exceptions, so that was very promising because it's a, a relatively close relative of culinaris, which makes the breeding um, simpler. So similar to the Aphanomyces in P, um, we sort of then started working on developing markers. Um, so for marker development, you always need a, a population, so you have to make a cross and then um, develop the offsprings into what is called recombinant inbred lines. So we had um, one cross here of uh, an lens orientalis by lens orientalis cross with 184 lines. And they were then um, evaluated by pathogenicity testing and they were genotyped. And then um, you end up with what is called this linkage map, which in the ideal case, um, shows you the seven chromosomes. Um, you see only, so these are the, the lollipop sticks again, you only see six here and that's because uh, chromosome two and seven, um, because there is an inversion, could not be separated, but fortunately that did not affect um, the further work to identify the quantitative trait regions associated with aphanomyces resistance. So we identified four regions that were significantly associated with resistance based on several experiments and then developed markers based on, on those regions. Now here's a similar table to what I showed you before and um, what I sort of want to highlight here is this column with the R square. You remember with the P, um, these values went up to 60%. So here in the lentil, it is quite a bit lower. Um, now that is probably a re reflection of this particular population, um, but may also just be because in the P table, much, much more data and many more populations um, were combined. And this is only based on one, one population. So what we did then, we um, sorted these 184 lines um, of that population based on the number of resistance QTLs, just to see what the effect uh, is really like. So on the vertical, you have root rot severity again, and on the horizontal is um, sort of lined out how many and which QTLs they had. Looks very complicated, but I made it very simple. So here highlighted in green are the lines that had the four resistance QTLs we identified. In red are the lines that had one or no resistance QTL. And very clearly you can see um, the impact of these QTLs in that population. So that, that is very promising. Now, because we know that uh, lentil also is affected by Fusarium avination, we, we were lucky that we also get fun got funding to look at Fusarium resistance. And um, what we decided to do um, is to look at a diverse set of lentil cultivars and also the same wild lentil accessions that we had um, evaluated for Aphanomyces root rot resistance. And what I'm showing you here are the sort of the first results for those wild lentil accessions. Um, what we did, we picked the best 
um, lines for aphanomyces root rot resistance and so that's on the on the vertical here so the lower the dot the more resistant and tested those as well for fusarium root rot resistance and so i highlighted here this green quadrant and you can see that there are many lines um, that have fairly good aphanomyces root rot resistance and also fusarium root rot resistance so that's sort of from a breeding perspective very nice because it means you may only have to use one or a few lines for the crossing and it's not as if you have to um, make crosses with very diverse um, lines to move the fusarium and the aphanomyces root rot resistance into the cultivated species so that's very promising um, and we were just um, informed that we got new funding uh, from ADF and SPG to combining just those two sources, Aphanomyces and Fusarium avinaceum. Um, what we are doing here is we're developing a multi-parent advanced generation intercross or magic population, not the magic bullet, but a magic population. And it's not my acronym, that's what breeders and molecular biologists invent, um, where we make a lot of complex crosses. Um, so it's a very crossing intensive program um, to combine four sources of fusarium and aphanomyces resistance with four elite lentil lines. So what we are trying to do there, obviously, is combining the aphanomyces and fusarium resistance. So we will be evaluating um, those lines uh, for those two traits. But we also want to look, look at seed coat color, because as I've shown with the P, very clearly seed coat color is an important trait when it comes to the root rots. And um, you want to make sure that you have resistance sources that are independent of seed coat color so that you can breed resistance in all of the different market classes. So the idea here is then also to identify QDLs associated with the root rot resistance and seed coat color. But obviously sort of with the lentil, um, we have to do the groundwork. So this is still um, a longer term project to get to resistant varieties. But we hope with the development of markers, we can speed that up. Next, talking uh, about root rot in chickpea. Um, so you're, many of you may have heard or read about the chickpea plant health issues. Um, you're still a bit mystified what is exactly going on. There are a lot of hypotheses that maybe herbicide damage may have been part of it, nem nematode, nematodes, resistance breakdown of ascochida blight, or some nutrient deficiencies, but root rots um, have also been implicated. Um, I showed this um, pie chart or similar pie chart before with the fusarium species, but I sort of want to point out here that we also identified some other um, pathogens that have been associated with chickpea root rot. That's Macrophomina faseolina, Verticillium dali, Bickelmyomyces, and Phytophthora. But they are sort of um, seem to be less prevalent than the fusarium species. So um, once you have isolated all these different species um, in a root rot complex, it's always important to check, okay, are they really all um, virulent pathogens or are they just opportunistic pathogens or saprophytes that sort of hang around and once there are open wounds, um, invade as well. So we tested different um, species here in three experiments. And what we found very clearly is that Fusarium avinaceum in all experiments um, appear to be the most virulent. But having said this, when we tested, looked at three different Fusarium avinaceum isolates, um, there seems to be a little bit of variability. And Chama Chatterton as, at Air Canada and Lethbridge and colleagues are sort of having a closer look at Fusarium avinaceum to see how much variability there is in this species and very, whether, whether there is specialization to certain crops, um, pulse crops, but also um, whether there are isolates that are specialized on cereals because um, all of these fusarium species can also be found on the cereals. Here in chickpea, and that contrast to pea and lentil, fusarium solani appears to be less virulent. 
And the same seems to be the case for Fusarium redolence. So although we recover them very often from the roots, they seem just to be hanger on us, but not the really um, virulent pathogens we need to focus on. However, Fusarium culmorum created quite a bit of disease, but was not the most prevalent species, hence our decision to start working on Fusarium um, avenaceum in the chickpea. I also want to point out Verticillium dalii here, um, which at least in one year we found quite a bit, um, and it, that caused a fair bit of disease as well, so that is probably a pathogen that we need to watch. Okay, so um, together with Bunya Minteran, our chickpea breeder, we um, put together a very diverse chickpea germplasm collection here and screen them for Fusarium avenaceum. And as you can see here, again on the vertical is um, the, the root rod severity and the bars representing the different lines. Um, that we had a wide range in Desi, which I color coded red here, and Kabuli chickpea. You will notice that sort of the lowest disease severity is um, in the in the chickpea, uh, in the these desi chickpeas. And again, that probably goes back to the um, dark pigmented seed coat you have in the desi chickpea, which appears to convey resistance. So these results are all of lines tested with a seed coat on. And again, because we, we want, of course, sort of identify sources of resistance that are seed code independent. We will um, take the best of both groups, um, remove the seed code and test them without the seed code as well to see whether there is also resistance conferred by um, genes that regulate resistance in, in the embryo. So seed code independent resistance. And that hopefully will help us to identify the best sources um, of resistance, in particular for the Kabuli, which are the more attractive um, group of chickpeas. That's all I have to present here today. Thank you for your attention. Um, and I sort of want to finish with this slide uh, from the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture, in particular with the root rods, the surveys that are all organized through the Ministry of Agriculture these days have been really, really helpful for, for my research programs and that of the pulse breeders here. So I would really like to encourage you to um, participate in these surveys. So um, sign up and allow surveys to be done on your land because it is to your benefit in the end if we know what is going on in commercial fields. And with that, I would like to thank you. And I guess we'll then move on to the next speaker. Well, thank you very much for a very informative presentation. Uh, it's really exciting to see the work being done towards root rot resistance, and we really look forward to future updates. Uh, if you have questions for Dr. Berninger, please type them in the question box, and we'll address them in the Q&A discussion at the end of the session. So up next, we are happy to have Laurie Hayes uh, to provide an overview of the online Saskatchewan Seed Guide. Uh, Laurie is the Executive Director for Saskatchewan Seed Growers Association. So welcome, Laurie. Good morning. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to talk some more about our interactive SAS Seed Guide. And um, I'm just going to call up uh, the screen. I think that looks great, Lori. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thanks again, uh, like I said, for letting us talk about our interactive SAS seed guide. Um, the genesis behind the seed guide is that. Uh, the printed seed guide is very popular and we have over 17,000 that are distributed annually throughout Saskatchewan and also to Alberta, Manitoba, and North Dakota. For our members, the seed guide is probably their most effective marketing tool. But technology does advance and so must the, the Saskatchewan, the SAS seed guide. So how do we make it easier for producers to find pedigreed seed? We put basically we took everything that's in the printed SAS seed guide 
and converted it to an interactive, filterable, database style and mobile friendly version. Uh, we Another key component that we wanted in there was that it was geo-referenced so that the location of the pedigree seed growers was easy to find. And we were very fortunate to secure funding through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership that is a federal provincial territorial initiative. Some of the advantages of this interactive SAS seed guide is that it's user-friendly, it's online, it's mobile, and it's a decision-making tool that improves the competitive ability of Saskatchewan farmers. Uh, it's very quick and accurate. It's based on the criteria that the user selects. It quickly identifies uh, pedigree seed growers who have seed available, and it's very easily updated. For example, last week we heard that one of our seed growers their a data was missing from the printed guide but we already have it uh, updated to our interactive SAS seed guide i'll show you uh, well i'm going to do a demonstration so the uniqueness of this is that it's nonpartisan, scientifically robust information so that comes from the regional variety trials and basically all of that data comes right out of the variety of grain crops that is compiled and published by the Ministry of Agriculture. And also it's very unique in its search capabilities because you can search on many, many criteria. I'll show you some as uh, I move to the demonstration. And it marries that research data from those regional variety trials with the pedigreed seed growers who have certified seed available for commercial growers. There's a couple caveats. One is that uh, there are some varieties that have no data, so they won't be found in the, the drop down where you're looking for that variety, but you will be able to find who has the seed. Conversely, there are varieties that are in the regional variety trials that have not yet gone out to the seed growers so they, there might be data but there would not be any seed growers with that seed available and where is it it's on our website it's specifically the interactive SAS seed guide you'll see the big button on the front page and if you've got any questions you can contact me at the contact information below but now i'm going to move over and do a live demonstration of the interactive SAS seed guide. And I'm going to turn off my camera. <clears throat> so this is the interactive SAS seed or the, the homepage of our website. Uh, this is the working, this is the background one. We've got it queued up to go live in the next couple days. And so what we start with is about the interactive SAS seed guide in here. We acknowledge all the funding, et cetera. We have this resources for selecting plant um, resources. It has all of the articles that are in the variety of grain crops. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when we go to the tools that are here, if you know what variety you already want then that's pretty easy you just type it in let's say you're looking for sublime it you just type in the first few letters it gives you options you hit find seed it takes you to another page shows you the crop kind the class the breeding institution the distributor and then it also shows you the seed growers who have it available in this case there's one seed grower most of the seed growers are hyperlinked either to a website or an email address. And then we've got the georeferenced map that shows exactly where the seed is available. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the next part of the tool is select, is a, where you want to find the data. This is for finding seed if you know what you're looking for. This is to resource the data. So I'll just do a couple examples here. 
uh, pulses, we're going to go to chickpeas, we'll pick kabuli, and then you run the report. So you're looking at the report. Here is all the, the data. It here's all the data that's already in the variety of grain crops, including all the footnotes and all of the additional information hyperlinked to all the different articles or documents that would be in the printed guide. And let's say, okay, I want to look at CDC Lancer. I look at that. Oh, those numbers look good. Where's the seed? So you click on the variety. It goes to the same sort of page as the last one. Again, variety name, the crop kind, the class, where it was developed, who's the distributor. And then it again shows you a map of everybody across the province who has it. The locations are in alphabetic order. And again, these people are all hyperlinked to either a C, um, website or an email. And then the over here is the class. So anything that's got a C is, is what is currently available as certified seed. These are select, foundation, registered, different levels. Lori had already mentioned about some of the varieties that will be available in a couple years. So if we found one here that had S only, that means that it would be available commercially in like two or three years. So that's a very, very quick overview of the um, interactive SAS seed guide. We certainly encourage you to try it as well as tell all your customers to go there to see what, you know, if they want the, the data on the varieties that they're looking for. And uh, we're very pleased with this new tool. We hope that you find it as helpful and interactive as we hope that it is. So thank you so much again for allowing us to highlight our new exciting tool. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Lori. Uh, this is gonna be a great resource for growers. Uh, I think it's fantastic. Again, if you have questions for Lori, please type them in the question box and we will address them in the Q&A discussion at the end of the session. Uh, Lori's presentation uh, was a great segue into my next uh, presentation, which will be on our online retail variety trial portal. All right, so what we have here, um, we wanted to provide yield data uh, by location to growers, and this would provide a new decision-making tool for growers. Um, better performing varieties mean better profits, and growers can now access years of detailed trial data on any device, including mobile devices. Uh, by showing multiple years of uh, yield data by location, growers are equipped to make informed decisions to select varieties best adapted to their area of the province. This portal allows growers to compare pulse variety yield data across locations and years. Uh, if you visited the portal in the past, make sure to go back and have a look as we refresh the data by adding new data from 2021 and 2022. And for some of these varieties, it represents up to 13 years of data, uh, depending on how long the variety has been entered in the regional variety trials. And just to note that uh, varieties must have a minimum of three years of data before it's included in the portal, you know, to try to have as much strength in the data as possible. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a demo. So this is uh, the whole web page for SAS Pulse Growers. There are two places where you can access the portal. One is at the top here, and the other is right at the bottom, where it says compare pulse, pulses by region. So into the portal, and you can start exploring. You can either type in an area, or you can click on explore the map. So we'll do that. Then you can select a, a type of crop. I'm just going to move my camera here. Uh, that's a bit uh, In this case, we'll select P. And now we can, uh, if we want, we can uh, click on a location. So let's try Lucky Lake and look at trials. And then view varieties. 
So now it shows you what varieties have been tested at this location. And uh, we can now uh, select the type we want. So let's go to yellow peas. And this will show the yellow peas that have been tested at Lucky Lake. And uh, so now uh, we can click on a variety to see data for it. So let's say we want to look at CDC Inca. And we can click on View Variety. And this will now show data of CDC Inca at Lucky Lake. And here's the comparison of the different years. How did it perform each year? And you can look at percent of check. So you can see the, the range uh, by year of how it performed. You can look at kilograms per hectare, pounds per acre, or bushels per acre. So you have all those options. And here's the same thing in a line graph. And as you toggle over it, you can see the uh, actual numbers for, for yield. And there's a table of the same data. And there's a, a, be a description of the variety as well. So now if you wanna compare varieties, you click on compare varieties and you can select a crop type so in this case let's let's try a lentil a type let's go to small red and then we can select up to five varieties that we may want to compare so let me get that out of the way there we go okay so let's try uh cdc maxim as the check and let's try our CDC impulse and here why not a new one CDC nimble we'll just go with three and then you can select up to three locations um, so let's try Eastaw and foster for something more diverse and perhaps swift current So then you get a graph like this that'll show um, by year the comparison between the three varieties and they're color coded. So green is maxim, uh, impulse is this blue color, nimble is the yellow. And as you toggle over each one, it'll give uh, the data uh, for that particular site. Then you can look at different years. So 2021, how did they compare? Uh, 2020. Um, in that case, we didn't have swift current that year. That was the year of COVID. So some sites were not available. Uh, 2019. In this case, uh, a couple of sites uh, weren't successful, so we just have the one site. So that's why you'll see different um, data or different sites having data and, and than in other years. Uh, there's also a line graph. Uh, if we go back to say 2021, where we have all three sites and see how they performed overall. And then a table again with all of the data for those varieties. So you can go very, very detailed data on this. Now, if you want to click on pulse varieties, again, you're gonna select a crop. So why don't we try chickpea and uh, we'll go with kabulis. And this will show all of uh, the different varieties that have been tested and entered into the portal and their locations. So now we can um, view varieties either by all data or we can go with a mean average. So that would be then average over um, all locations. And all data is by location. Uh, in this case, if you then if you want to get detailed information um, on a variety at that location, you can select one. Um, you can, in this case, it's going from 2010 up. I'm going to change that so it's newer. And we'll try CDC Orkney. 
a little bit of information about CDC Orkney, uh, a few pictures of it. And then a variety overview. And again, you can have presenter check. And looking pretty good there. Uh, Telegrams to Hector, et cetera. The, the other interesting thing is by being able to look at uh, you know, yield in kilograms or, or bushels, as you can see, which years uh, had good performance. And one of the values of this is then you can look at another variety and, and see if one variety stands up better under um, poor conditions versus another one. And then there's a line graph too, and here you can see 2021. Well, we all know that that was a dry year, so uh, yield was, was down overall, but it still yielded 114% of the check, so it held up pretty good. Lori, there's just a couple minutes left. Yep, okay, that's perfect, because I one more little thing here and we'll be done. Uh, the other option is you can click on a location. Uh, go back to the one I had. And if you click on a location, then it'll show you um, all the varieties that were tested at that location. And then, and then you can go back and look at the individual varieties again. So that concludes what, uh, what I have to show you for um, for our web portal. And I hope that you will have a lot of use out of it. And please access it at uh, any time. Okay. And I guess I'm still on for the next, for the introduction of our next speaker. And I see my camera is still not right. So our next presentation is on the Pulse Quality Program. And this is brought to us by Janelle Carlin who is the Director of Quality and Processing with Pulse Canada. Janelle oversees technical and research initiatives related to pulse crop quality, processing, and utilization. As part of Pulse Canada's market innovation team, Janelle works with companies globally to provide support on the broader category of pulses and pulse ingredients. So welcome, Janelle. Thank you, Laurie. All right, uh, let me know if anything is up with my screen or if you can't see it, but otherwise I'll just uh, continue on. Uh, so thank you uh, to Saskatchewan Pulse Growers for the opportunity to, to present here today. So I'm just going to be touching on the importance of monitoring the quality of new varieties. And in this context here, when we're talking about quality, um, it's a little bit more related to um, end use quality uh, of some of the crop um, here. So uh, the one thing I wanted to start off with um, is just touching on that when we're talking about end use quality of pulse crops, what we're seeing here, especially in recent years, is an evolving landscape for Canadian pulses. So overall, there's an industry-wide effort to drive volume of these crops in either diversified markets and new, new regions to sell into or, or new end use applications. So this slide here just presents um, the framework for that 25 by 2025 industry strategy, um, where we do see a really concerted effort to drive either value added processing of crops or to utilize the whole seed in different ways, whether that is in um, whole lentils for food service consumption or dry beans for um, Canadian retail consumption. Um, so, so the one thing I wanted to mention is, is keeping that in mind, the, the type of information that we do have access to variety specific information on uh, is a little bit more related to that agronomic performance as well as the physical seed size. And that's super important. But when we're looking to expand and diversify the ways that, that pulse crops are being utilized, um, it's important to, to link this with some of these quality metrics that are a little bit more relevant for processing. Um, so here you can see that um, on the pea side it is, is something that we're starting to see that protein um, pop up in this variety specific data but otherwise if we look across the rest of the the types of pulse crops that we're analyzing um, we don't necessarily have that level of detailed information on that variety specific level 
Um, and especially the food industry. So when we're talking about either diversifying whole consumption or really driving that ingredient industry, this is something that um, not having access to that variety specific information can introduce a lot of variability, um, which in turn can, can potentially make them choose not to utilize pulse ingredients. So I, I like to use this example all the time. Um, when we're looking at variety registration for wheat classes, um, the quality um, related to end uses is something that's considered um, as part of the variety registration process where specific varieties are evaluated based on their, their protein content, seed hardness, uh, gluten strength, as well as their performance in, in dough and, and baking systems. Um, and we do have varieties that are better suited to produce pastries versus something like a, a pan bread. Um, and, and that level of variability and quality does exist when in the limited data that we do have on pulse varieties when specifically when we're talking about food utilization um, but as an emerging ingredient industry we just don't have all of the information there um, which illustrates the importance to to start to monitor uh, this level of information uh, the other comparison that i like to pull here is that when we're looking um, at the weed industry there are specific tools in place that allow to monitor uh, individual varieties based on their quality. So here's just a photo of a farina graph, which is a common tool that's used to monitor dough quality uh, in bakeries. And, and that's just an example of a specific tool for that industry where you can actually discern uh, whether or not uh, a specific variety um, might be suited for a particular application. And, and we don't necessarily have those tools developed yet when we're talking about the pulse ingredient sector. So all, all that being said is when we're talking about pulse quality um, related to some of these end use applications, it's definitely a complicated subject. Um, and we're just starting to fill in the picture here. So a lot of the data that we've collected to date is really focusing on, on these two first questions. So, so looking at um, what are the differences across pulse types, What's the effect of individual variety? How do they differ in terms of their composition? Uh, the presence of contaminants? And then how are all of those things affected by the, the growing environment and the agronomic practices that are applied? Um, getting in then to how do all of these factors relate to how it might perform in a pasta versus a bread application? And how do we measure that? Um, so, so going back to, we don't necessarily have the tools um, that are pulse specific to measure their performance um, in a, in a range of applications. And then also understanding that depending on who you're talking to, um, there might be different requirements. So, so looking at um, if you're taking lentils, whole lentils, um, the quality requirements for uh, someone who's preparing those lentils for a canning process will vary significantly from someone who is going to source those lentils to produce flour. Uh, for a food product. Um, so all of that being said, uh, I just wanted to, to take some time here and provide a snapshot of some of the results to date looking at uh, pulse quality. Um, and this is part of the regional variety trials where we've taken a subsample uh, of some of those individual trial locations to further analyze them for quality um, and parameters that are a little bit more related to process stability. Uh, so as part of that, um, we have about one to four years worth of data that are looking at the individual effects of either variety and or environment for some of the parameters that are listed here on this slide. Um, and we have that for yellow pea, lentil and fava beans at the moment. Um, so a lot of the data that I'm presenting here today is going to be on yellow pea specifically just because that's where we have the most um, number of years of information. Um, but we can kind of slice and dice the data in any way. So if there's any interest on, on any of the other varieties after today's webinar, uh, just feel free to reach out um, and happy to discuss further. So getting into the types of information that this can give us when we're looking at this detailed quality analysis, uh, it really helps us get a sense of year-to-year -year variability um, for these specific varieties. And that's really useful when we go to talk to international customers of Canadian crops in terms of understanding Canadian quality and helping to define what the Canadian brand is. 
um, for pulse quality. Um, and it also helps for some of our domestic food processors here understand how variable the products that they're sourcing might be, um, which is going to affect their process and their ingredients. Um, so getting into some of these specific parameters, moisture content, um, in combination with things like the, uh, the seed uh, size as well as the seed breakage are, are very important when we're talking about primary processing because that affects how much time and the settings applied during dehulling processes. Uh, protein content, obviously very important for that protein fractionation industry um, and interesting here when we're looking year to year, uh, 2021 being a very hot and dry year, we did see um, a, an increase in the overall protein content for that year. Um, things like fat, uh, even though they're in relatively minor concentrations for wet fractionation specifically uh, to produce protein isolates, we do see that even a 1% difference in fat can affect the yield up to about 5% for that protein separation efficiency. So th that can be pretty significant in terms of the economics for some of these protein fractionators. Um, and, and then that heavy metal and mineral analysis that we accumulate, these, these can kind of give us indications on specific things. So I, I'm going to touch on cadmium specifically later, uh, but calcium as an example is a mineral where the ions have been related to hydration and water uptake characteristics. So this is something that might be a little bit more important for uh, canning processes or, or just whole uh, cooking characteristics for, for pulses. So getting into that variety specific information, this is really kind of the bulk and, and really interesting information um, to, to dig in on. So protein content is obviously uh, one of the more relevant parameters when we're talking about the food industry. Um, and, and with the, this large collection of data that we've accumulated, we can really start to see certain varieties that are uh, significantly higher on a year to year basis and regardless of the growing environment um, than others for protein content. Um, so some of the varieties that have caught attention from fractionators based on discussions that we've had include um, AAC Deli or CDC Loechko, um, where they're, they're averaging a little bit higher protein content. Um, but that's not to say that that's the only thing that's relevant. So, so for example, CDC Meadow, uh, although it's a, it's a little bit of an older variety, um, this is one that has been found to be particularly well suited to create pasta. Uh, pea-based pasta product, um, and, a, and a lot of that can be attributed to um, that reduced protein content, where protein in applications like pasta or extruded snacks can actually interfere with the structure of the product. So if we're looking for those types of applications and making flour for snacks and pastas, um, we might want to recommend some of the varieties. Uh, we'll look at something like AAC Carver, um, which is a little bit lower on the protein side, but that might be okay, uh, depending on the customer that we're talking to. Janelle, you just have a few minutes remaining. Sounds good. Um, la another thing that we can look at is uh, cadmium. So this is heavy metal accumulation mineral, um, getting into that location specific data. So we have a pretty good understanding of regional distributions of cadmium in soils. And that's something that comes up here when we look at location specific accumulation, um, where that 0 0.04 line is that maximum residue limit for cadmium. Um, and, and what we're starting to see here that's really interesting is actually a variety by location interaction effect where certain varieties appear to be maybe accumulating cadmium at a higher or a lower rate. And although we can't conclusively say anything based on, on the limited data that we do have available, this is something that we might want to consider monitoring uh, given that there is that, that 0 0.04 parts per million limit in place. Uh, lastly, the last type of information that we can really um, gain from this is understanding the relative influence for each of these factors on variability. So um, on the left hand side here, we're looking at starch. Um, and what we see here in, the, in this pie graph is based on all of the variability that we're seeing in starch, how much of that can we attribute to the individual location or to the individual variety. Uh, and for starch, you can see here that the majority proportion of that variability is accounted for by the location, uh, which is mainly some weather effects that we're seeing. Um, whereas amylose, which is one of the building blocks of starch, um, it's interesting here that we do start to see a higher 
higher significance of, of variety influence and a variety by location interaction, which means that individual varieties um, might be a little bit more distinct from one another or might distinctly act um, differently depending on where they're grown. Um, and this is specifically amylose, a little bit more related to functionality rather than purely composition. Uh, so all that um, kind of being said, I just wanted to mention that when we're talking about pulse quality, it's important to consider this all throughout the value chain. So we're just starting to get an understanding on some of these cultivars and agronomic conditions and how that might affect the quality, uh, but it relates all the way through uh, to the end. Um, and this is highlighted here. So I just this is just an example of a published study uh, where they looked at individual pea and lentil varieties um, and found that it did affect the flower quality and that in turn affected uh, the bread quality for bread that was baked even only with 20% um, inclusion rate of these flowers. Uh, lastly here, I just wanted to end um, on it's really important as well to continuously monitor quality uh, of these varieties because the varieties and the conditions are constantly evolving over time. So simply having one, two, three years worth of data isn't giving us the full picture uh, and that this type uh, of program, the pulse quality program, is something that's important to really monitor uh, over time uh, to consider all of these factors. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll close it off here and uh, we can uh, potentially have some questions later on. So thank you. Oh, great. Thank you so much, General, for your presentation. We're really looking forward to building a database of quality data on pulse crop variety and location. So this is fantastic. All right. So we're now going to move into some live Q&A with our presenter panel. Our presenter panel. For our panel participants, please turn on your cameras at this time. And I'm going to hand things off to Sherilyn Phelps, who is our Director of Research and Development at SPG. So Sherilyn, you are welcome to start asking questions. Thanks, Lori. And we do have a number of questions that have come in, and I encourage everyone to continue entering questions. We'll watch them and watch the question panel that's on the GoToWebinar um, uh, box that's on the on the side of your computer. So please continue entering. Um, we will start off uh, with questions starting from the the more or the earlier sessions. So this these ones are to Lori. Um, the first question is: Do you have any information on lupins, or know if they've been grown in Canada? Uh, lupins have been grown in Canada. I don't have a lot of information on them. Uh, there aren't uh, a lot of varieties available yet, but uh, there are, um, particularly I think in Alberta is where there's some being produced, but uh, also, you know, we'll look at them in Saskatchewan and, uh, and see how they perform here. Okay, thank you. A similar question, but on a different crop and just asking about soybeans. There was no okay. mention of soybean varieties today and, and just wondering, if there's going to be something coming up or why they were admitted. Yeah, actually, I, I think if I'd had more time, I really would love to talk about soybeans. Uh, there's uh, um, some really fantastic varieties actually coming out. Uh, Syngenta has some very high yielding varieties that are worth checking out. If you look in the SAS seed guide, um, you can tell which ones are, you know, the earlier maturing or in the higher yielding. Um, still, I think in soybeans, we need to, to you know, improve the maturity to have really good consistent production in Saskatchewan, but it has, uh, there are some really good varieties that have the potential to mature in time and have then good yield. Great. Thank you. Question now about um, chickpea varieties. So you had mentioned CDC Pearl. Um, is there good market acceptance of CDC Pearl despite its smaller seed size? Yeah, that one is really new, and so it'll be interesting to see what the uptake is. I know that, uh, you know, um, buyers are looking for a larger seed, so it'll depend um, whether, you know, they're willing to, to use a smaller seed size. So I think we'll have to keep an eye on that one and see whether it has a fit or not. Um, so, you know, I don't have a really good answer for that, and I don't know if someone else on the panel does, but uh, 
Um, I, you know, I know that the larger seed is is something that the processors are looking for, or the buyers are looking for. Okay. Thank you. Um, last question for you at the moment. There may be more as they come through, but I'm going to ask you all the questions at once as you're thinking about this. Um, how are we working to ensure the low vicing, con vicing remains true as we grow this crop? And as you mentioned, they do all crops to some degree. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be a challenge. And that's why, you know, they're being released on a closed loop basis. Um, that, you know, the person who is has a license to, to uh, grow seed and also for commercial production is monitoring things like isolation distances and then monitoring the, the product that comes off the field. Uh, there'll be quality testing required. Uh, molecular markers can be used as well to get an idea of the, um, if the trait has been protected and it meets the qualifications for low vicing, con vicing. And, you know, it's important that these things are, uh, that trait is maintained carefully because what we don't wanna see is uh, you know, product being delivered to the processor that doesn't mean, meet the, the spec and then it does harm to what is really a fledgling market at this time. And since it has a lot of potential, we don't want to see that happen. Great. Thank you, Lori. Um, I'm going to move on to Sabine now. So when it comes to fusarium species, which species are, the most, are we most concerned with that affect them more commonly? Um, sort of our primary target is Fusarium abinaceum. That seems to be a the most common one and b probably the most virulent one. Um, but at least in pea and lentil, it's fairly closely followed by Fusarium solanae and Fusarium oxysporum. On a similar note, for the Fusarium wilt ratings, what race is that based on? So when I talk about Fusarium solanae or Fusarium oxysporum, that where there are isolates that cause wilt, we are not specifically looking at wilt pathogens, but root rot pathogens. So um, we only tested the roots of Fusarium uh, of chickpea specifically for the wilt isolates, and we could not identify the wilt pathogen, but we have the root rot pathogen here. So they had sort of two different groups. Okay. And one other question on, on fusarium particularly, will the fusarium root rot ratings be included in the variety selection guides? So in the seed guides and, and the interactive options that are there. Well, I'm sure eventually that will happen, but I assume that will only happen once we have um, resistance or varieties with partial resistance in the panel of available varieties because right now there's probably no point it would for the most part say susceptible i mean it's sort of you as i as i sort of try to emphasize right now we know that a dark seed coat helps with root rot resistance specifically fusarium but of course you want to <laughs> grow yellow or green pea so that is not really helpful Okay, thank you. Um, once varieties with partial resistance to aphanomyces are, com are commercially available, what type of management will be needed to preserve them, keep them functioning? That is a very good question, and that is something the industry has to discuss because, um, I mean, I assume everybody is sort of familiar with the club root story where they introduce the first resistant canola varieties. They were grown everywhere, and the resistance broke down in two years. We don't want to see that with our pea varieties because there is nothing else in the pipeline, right? And so the industry has to think about a deployment strategy and it could be something um, through crop insurance as is done with the Ascochida blood and chickpea, right? Where you have to follow certain management strategies or you don't get um, crop insurance. There are various options, but that has to be discussed by the industry. And I guess time time is uh, of the essence as newer varieties will be coming out in a, in a few years. Um, and that leads into a, another question from a, an attendee, and that is what research approaches are necessary 
to accelerate developing pulse varieties that are resistant to the root rot complex? Um, I mean, sort of the, the most time consuming part is at the beginning where you have to develop the tools. So for example, the molecular markers, and I think the, the timeline I showed for what they did in France shows that very quickly. Once you have started to um, transfer resistance into your germplasm, um, they become sort of part of the breeding strategy. So once it's in the breeding program, it's a fairly continuous project the or process it's just sort of this first part that is very time consuming and some some of these things there is nothing you can do to really make it faster other than ensuring that you have continuous funding to to keep going going at it there are just some processes that require a certain amount of time okay um as, as we're, you know, looking and talking about management strategies, um, is there any true seed treatment that can help with aphanomyces? I mean, obviously there are registered products, um, but um, based on the field studies that have been done, for example, at Egg Canada, they only seem to have very limited efficacy. And what I try to always emphasize is also, I mean, the, the purpose of a seed treatment is really to um, ensure that the seed germinates and your seedling establishes. So they are usually effective for maybe three weeks, four weeks, right? But with these root rot pathogens, they can infect any time during the growing season. So a seed treatment is um, very unlikely to protect your plant throughout the growing season unless someone comes up with a seed treatment where for example, through a, a, a biocontrol agent where the biocontrol agent continues to colonize the, the root system as the plant grows, but we don't have that yet. Okay, thank you. Um, on to, still on to root rots, um, talking about susceptibility to aphanomyces, and is there a risk of faba beans becoming susceptible? There are, based on French research where they have looked in much more detail on faba, faba beans, there are some faba bean varieties um, that are more, a little bit more susceptible um, than sort of the, the varieties we have tested. Um, for a pathogen to sort of become a major, or to just switch host, it's, it's a very complex process for a pathogen. So, um, assuming that you follow some common sense management pro management strategies, I, I doubt that this can happen unless we don't pay attention to this at all and import some germplasm that is already very susceptible. Thank you. He's switch, switching gears to different diseases now, so you got to wear your non-root rot hat. But um, and, and it kind of crosses over to Lori's discussion on varieties. Um, in that, it was mentioned that improved anthracnose resistance with a large green lentil variety, CDC Grim, um, is that resistance to the race that is most prevalent here? Do we know? Um, I actually, when Lori said this, I had a quick look at at my data. Um, I wouldn't call it, I mean, I mean, sort of the prevalent race is the virulent race zero. Um, and what you find in the seed guide is race one data. And the reason for that is um, so far, we don't really have very good race zero resistance in any of the lentil germplasm. Um, so I had a look at that variety in terms of race zero resistance. It's a sort of a little bit more resistant than the susceptible check but I would probably call it moderately susceptible, not moderately resistant. So no, the simple answer is sort of the, the prevalent race is the virulent race zero, and no, we don't yet have really good resistance in our lentil germplasm. So we still have work for you. Yes, <laughs> that's sort of the next project next year. Or Great. applying for it this year and then starting next year, yes. A um, couple just more disease-related questions. Um, can ver verticillium dahlia also impact other pulse crops, such as lentils or faba bean? You had mentioned that you found it in chickpeas. 
um, has it been found anywhere else and can it have other hosts? Um, it has been identified in other crops in the, but I'm not completely, I don't remember now what exactly. This is a very good question and I think when the pea and lentil service were done, I don't think they actually tested for verticillium, so it, it would probably be valuable to maybe test some pea and lentil as well. Um, I don't think it is a major player yet, um, because even in the chickpea, it's sort of still the, the smaller participant in the root rot complex. But it could become more important um, because, I mean, our climate is changing and so that can may have an impact on which pathogens are more competitive in the soil and also on, on the leaves, right? Thank you. One more disease question. Um, are there any disease concerns with growing soybeans and yellow peas in the rotation? Um, I think the only diseases I could think of if we had really, really wet years would be sclerotinia. But if you have sclerotinia problems, you probably have other problems as well. So there's nothing that springs to mind. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to let you have the hook now for some disease questions and move on to Lori Hayes. Um, the first question I have is, when will the interactive seed guide be available in full? Um, actually, probably later today or tomorrow. We've, we've got it all queued up and we've just got a couple fine tuning things to do. Uh, what I was showing today is actually the demo page and that's gonna be live within the next couple days. That's great, that looks like a great resource. I'm excited to be able to use that. The other question I have is, how is the tool updated? When would, for example, 2023 seed be entered and available to look for? We, uh, oh, how much, the seed? That well, people how, how is the tool updated with the data? So, you know, the next year's seed, when would it be, I guess, in the system to know that there's registered seed versus certified? We, we take the data from the regional variety trials and so once it goes to print for the printed seed guide, the same data goes to our website developers and then they start the process of uploading it. So we got the data finalized about December the 10th. And so by this week, hopefully we'll have it up and running because there's Christmas in the middle there. So that takes out two weeks. So it happens very quickly. And as I mentioned, if there's something that needs to be updated or there's an error, we can quickly do that, just go to them and they can just update things on the spot too, like if there's something that's wrong or needs to be changed. So we get it out, well, well within a week or six, uh, sorry, a month or six weeks. So it's pretty quick. Great. I think, maybe not, maybe they don't think so, but. <laughs> Well, it's always nice with new interactive tools. Um, they're always, you know, very accurate when you first release them and, and, and uh, the upkeep on, on keeping things updated is as, is as critical as releasing them. So that's exciting. Uh, moving on to Janelle, um, you're talking about the Pulse Quality Program and the importance of it continuing. Um, do you have plans for the continuation of this program? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you're probably better better suited to talk. I know Saskatchewan Pulse Growers has been implementing, uh, I think, the initial stage uh, of the Pulse Quality Program, and that's in partnership with the Saskatchewan Food Industry Development Centre. Um, related to the other, other provinces, I think it's in the plan to try to con continue some of that testing work, um, although I, what that might look like is, is kind of still under development, but I, I, do, I do think the work is, is going to continue in some capacity for sure, uh, at least under the SPG branch here. Thank you. Um, going back, uh, getting questions from all over the place, so trying to keep on top of those and make sure um, in the time allowed we can answer as many questions as we can. Um, so I'm going to go back to Lori Friesen and we're going to have some questions on faba beans. So what is the main difference between the two new faba bean lines, the 1142 and the 1089? Is there a difference in days to maturity? yield, 
protein, any other factors? Uh, mostly there's, uh, you know, quite a significant improvement in yield of uh, 1089 versus 1142. Uh, 1142 was the first one that uh, we were able to release. And, uh, you know, although it's a solid performing variety, 1089 came out, uh, you know, with the data sense and looking stronger for, for yield. And that was the main reason for uh, putting that one out as well. Exciting to see improvements and, and new varieties coming out with that pricing foundation. It's really nice to see. Yes, and, and the follow-up question from that is, when can we expect to see a fava bean with a shorter maturity than Snowbird? Uh, yeah, I mean, I know that, uh, you know, the breeders are, are working hard to try and improve uh, maturity. I, I think, you know, there was a lot of work being put towards converting all of the breeding material to low glycine, con glycine. Uh, so that has been a major focus for, for a while. And now that that's you know, incorporated into a lot of breeding lines, I think there can be more focus on, on traits like maturity. And I know that it's, it's a key trait that they're working on, um, but uh, you know, it's something that doesn't happen overnight, I think. Uh, you know, there isn't a lot of earliness in family to work with, and you don't want to sacrifice too much on yield either. And often those two traits are closely tied. Great, thank you. I think that kind of wraps up the summary um, of the questions, wraps up all the questions that have been asked uh, through the question box, and a few that have been texted directly. So I want to thank all our panelists for answering these questions and being patient as, as some of you got thrown a number of different ones um, to be able to change gears and, and be in that headspace. I want to say thank you and I'm going to turn it back to Lori Friesen who's going to do a wrap-up at this time. Great well thank you so much Sherilyn for moderating that. Uh, it's, it's a bit tricky to make sure you capture all the questions so that was great. Uh, again, I'd like to thank all of our presenters and as well as all the attendees. Uh, this does wrap up today's session. Any unanswered questions will be addressed after today's session and we will email the answers to all attendees. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, a recording of this event will be posted on SPD's website and you'll receive an email on how to access it. Also, you'll receive an email with a link to a survey for you to share your feedback. Your opinion helps us a lot to deliver valuable extension opportunities and continuously improve. So really appreciate any feedback you're willing to provide. Uh, also, registration is now open for SPG's winter pulse meetings. We will be making stops in Regina, Assiniboia, Elrose, and Melfort throughout January, February, and March. So check our website at pulse.com for more information. And at this time, I'd like to thank everyone again and wish you all a great day.